everyone. Welcome back to Microsoft Build Live. Um, my name's Amy Boyd, and I'm actually joined by Lance and Anand, who are from the Cognitive Services team. So in this session, we're going to be talking about what's new with Cognitive Services. Um, so my goodness, thank you very much for joining us. Um, can Thanks. you tell us a bit about yourselves? Uh, go ahead, Anand. Sure. Uh, my name is Anand, and I lead the program management for uh, Azure Cognitive Services platform. And I report to Lance. And I'm Lance Olson, and I, I lead our applied AI efforts uh, here at Microsoft, which includes cognitive services and Azure Search. Nice, nice. So yeah, thank you very much uh, for joining us online. Um, we obviously have so many things with cognitive services going on. So we only have 15 minutes, unfortunately. So mm -hmm. we're going to have to pick and choose a little bit between them. Um, if anyone online has questions, please go to aka.ms Microsoft Build Live. Um, ask your questions there, and we can ask these guys while they're here with us. Um, so yeah, aka.ms Microsoft Build Live. So let's get going when we've got enough time. Um, can you tell us a bit about what's going on? What's, what should we focus on? What should, what should we talk about? Yeah, so there are a few big things. I think the first thing I want to call out is we added a new category. So we've had vision, language, uh, speech, and search so far in cognitive services. But we've had a lot of demand for higher level capabilities that also provide recommendations and really action for customers. And so we've added a new category called decision. Okay. And the decision category, I've actually got a slide I brought with me here that um, kind of covers what we've got. But it has a personalizer, which is a new service that we've added, and also anomaly detector, which we added about uh, a month ago, and then also content moderator. So decision category, I guess that is more, uh, we're talking about like action-based stuff, are we? And uh, problem solving type things? Yeah, it's like the personalizer is a recommendation system that will basically look at a bunch of inputs for a given use case that you have, and it will tell you what are the things that you could present to your users that are most relevant to them and actually help them to, to get the best results and the best engagement with your application. Nice, nice. And um, I mean, I think we have a demo, right, of the personalizer. Yes. And it seems to be really a hot topic here at Yeah, Plus. yeah. Um, I mean, so yeah, let's, let's take a look at the demo on your device. All right, let me jump in here. So I've got a couple of things I wanted to show, actually, demo-wise. So the first one is personalizer. So the way this works is actually it uses reinforcement learning, which is a, a different kind of approach for machine learning, where you have a goal or an outcome that you want to achieve. In this case, it would be engagement. And then you have inputs, which are things like um, what, the, what you might know about the person that you're engaging with. Uh, information that might come from their profile or usage or external information like the weather or something like that. You give it that information, and then it comes back and makes a set of recommendations to you for what you should do in your application. And then depending on how the user responds, you calculate a reward back to the, back to the service. Based on the reward, the service learns what is compelling and what's not compelling for any given person and optimizes the experience. Nice. So in this demo, I have a personalizer demo page. And I have a question here, which is show personalizer or show a personalized article. And I can tweak some of the input parameters, like is it a work week, is it the morning, or is, and is it sunny or cloudy or rainy? And then you can see there's a timeout value here. And if I don't interact with this content at all, when the timeout value happens, it says a reward of zero was sent to the personalizer because nobody interacted with the page. But now if I go ahead and do that again, and it it uh, recommends something. Here, if I grab the scroll bar and I start scrolling, you can see that the reward gets calculated. So maybe if I only scrolled halfway down, then the reward of a 0.5 might get sent to the model. If I scrolled all the way to the bottom, it would get a reward of 1. And it, it likes rewards. That's its favorite thing. And so it will do whatever it can to optimize for the reward. And I can change the values, and I can look at different things and, and, uh, and ask for different recommendations. And one thing that I can also uh, point out here is, it also lets you control how much it explores versus uses the model that it's learned. So you want to balance, uh, you want to dedicate some time to exploring. Exploring in this case would be trying new recommendations that I might not, it doesn't know if I want or not. Okay. But that's how it learns. So this service actually learns in real time. There's no extended model training offline and redeployment loop. The whole thing learns in real time and it adapts to the, to the real world around us. So as the world changes, the model um, changes dynamically and learns in instantly. So that way, if you're doing recommendations and you're subject to um, 
changes in the world around you for your recommendations, it'll actually learn as those changes happen and be updated. Nice. So, because reinforcement learning, right, is it's cutting edge stuff. Like it's still in research almost. It is one of the the harder problems to solve in the machine learning space. Yeah, this this was a joint project actually between our engineering team and our research team that uh, specializes in reinforcement learning. And we had to do a, a whole project to all of the other deployments that we had to do before we built the service really required us to deploy a data scientist to tweak that model. And we were really able to um, uh, advance the state of the art here by enabling developers to do reinforcement learning without having to go into the AI frameworks to make it possible. Yeah, goodness me. And so like, if as a developer, I literally query this with an API, just like all the other cognitive services? Yeah, yeah. the way it works is you would basically just, as you're about ready to, if you have a mobile application or a web app, as you're about ready to show to your users what it is you want to display to them, you would call the, the personalizer service and you would say, you would send whatever information you think might be relevant to the decision, and it will come back with a list of what it should, what, it, uh, what order it should present, and which items to present. And then, based on the interaction that the user does, you have a timeout value by, and in that timeout value, you then send the reward back to the service. And based on the reward it gets, it learns and optimizes and changes the behavior. Nice, nice, very, very cool. And um, we, so this was the personalizer you mentioned, anomaly detection. And there's, and there's one more in that category, which is the content moderator. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's one other service I wanted to show that is in the, the vision category. Oh, right. And I know just we're, there's a ton of new stuff across all of these services, so I'm just trying to hit a couple key highlights. But the vision one is the form recognizer. And this one is one that we really built for, for people who are working with forms, with input forms of data, of information, where they're... They might be today doing data entry and typing those forms or the values from those forms in. This service actually learns the forms and then gives you a JSON document uh, representation of the forms. Okay. So for example, here I've got uh, this Contoso form, or you could click on different forms and see the examples like AdventureWorks. And then what I can do is, uh, and it would be hard to write a program that knows how to submit those. Like if you look at that address field, how does it know that uh, 4,000 4, Redmond, Washington is part of the address. There's, no, there's nothing in the form to tell you that. So we had to train the service to actually learn patterns like that. And so now when I um, go look at the result that I get for that form, I can see all the values that came back. I can see the address. I can see the bounding box for where those items were and um, get the information in a way that I can now work with it inside my application. Nice. So this is something that we think, uh, we actually showed a demo of this earlier this week with um, Starbucks and Financial yes. Fabric. And just in their case, this is something they said saves about 80, or 80 to 90 percent of the time that their analysts spend entering in data. Now they can spend that time actually focusing on the values of the data and the decisions that they want to make uh, using the data with form recognizer. I was going to say, because there's more paper-based stuff out there than we probably think. Like on a daily basis, how many times do you fill a form in, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's all the time. So this is perfect. Yeah, take away that burden of kind of, you know, data entry kind of stuff and all that. It's yeah, and, and to use it, all you have to do is feed in five examples of the form. So you feed in five forms. It will learn the underlying form from those five examples and then give you an endpoint that you can then deploy in your application and use it directly. Nice, five examples, yeah. like five, oh my mm -hmm. goodness. Like, yeah, <laughs> that's incredible. That's really, really impressive. And so, we, so we've talked about personalizer, we've talked about form recognizer. So again, being able to, in both these cases, completely either bring in data, action on data, personalize data, all depending on the user, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, and, and you mentioned we've had sessions uh, throughout Build with the Cognitive Services team. And Anand, you mentioned you've literally just had a session. Yeah, I had a session on uh, Cognitive Services for Enterprises. So right. Cognitive Services, typically people have been thinking about just developers, right? So the last year we spent a lot of time and energy to make it uh, enterprise grade. So we have the Cognitive Services, 17 of them GA in 25 regions and available with various certifications, HIPAA compliance, and so on and so forth. So uh, one of the areas I showcased uh, at my session, so if you switch to this uh, laptop, so um, is cognitive services with uh, Cosmos DB. Okay. So 
Cosmos DB um, uh, made a large announcement at the build, which is integration with native Spark. So right. uh, am I on the screen? So Yeah, I was going to say, can we just take a quick look at Anand's laptop? There we go. We're looking for slides. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. So, so this essentially shows integration of uh, uh, cognitive services with the Cosmos DB and Spark. And what we did was, this is the Cosmos DB announcements. And then what we did was, we took the data from NASCAR. Oh. We partnered with Hendrick Motorsports. And then, so what I'm going to switch here and showcase is a notebook. This is Cosmos DB notebook. Okay. And this is the kind of the end-to-end -end flow, right? You, we took the data from uh, Texas Motor uh, Speedway uh, from the race. Uh, we ingested them into Cosmos DB. So we got all the goodness of Cosmos DB, the globally distribution and all those. With the Spark integration, so we were able to build this and integrate with, uh, with uh, our cognitive services such as anomaly detector, which is a new category, yep. uh, speech to text, and so on and so forth. So let me quickly run through this. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is, as I mentioned, this is the data from the uh, Texas AAA 500 telemetry data. So when you ingest them, and I, when I, uh, so you can see here, I'm just going to run uh, a notebook so you can see the race positioning if it works. <laughs> I heard we have had some snafus with the live demos here. So. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Let's, fingers crossed. There so, we go. Yeah, so uh, give me one second. So I'll, I'll give one more try. So just a quick one. This this actual screen is not just Jupyter Notebooks, right? You've gone via the Azure portal, is it, and Cosmos DB, and then you've been able to have a notebook in Cosmos DB. This is Jupyter Hub in Cosmos DB. Amazing. Okay. Yeah, so this everything is here. I was trying to show you the race positioning. Let me do one more try. And uh, so... The, what I was planning to show was the race track and how right. things were going. And I have this notebook run. So you can see things like uh, brake time, throttle time. This is important for the drivers to understand, right? As the race is happening, this is real-time data that is being ingested. Right. Really want to understand. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the goodness of uh, Cosmo, uh, Spark, so you can things like, so let me run the, see if you can feed the anomaly here. So... The live demo is not working. What you would have seen is a bunch of anomalies. Right. And then if you zoom in to see, this is time series data, what's happening? This is beginning of this car crashing uh, in this case for this anomaly. So that's what uh, I see. we showcased the whole thing uh, today. And we were able to get the uh, data from the speech because when the drivers are speaking, it feels like it's going through like 10 different walkie-talkies. Right. And we were able to parse using speech to text Right. And then get that information back. So all of this happening in real time with uh, global distribution of Cosmos DB and cognitive services and Spark. Nice. Yeah. Because I guess everyone kind of as well as like, oh, well, how, how quick is the API call, right? Because if you have to call out to an API, it's, you know, you are going to have a bit of web traffic going on. So in that case, with real-time data, and those guys need it really fast, right? Uh, was that uh, containerized, or was that on, like, did you use it locally, or was that calling off to the APIs? Um, in this case, we just call the real-time API uh, for the demo purposes. Yeah. But I think uh, that's a great point. I think uh, with us containerizing, nice. we announced uh, 10 containers in uh, preview. Uh, including speech as a container in uh, Bill, anomaly detector, forms recognizer, all of these are containerized. So absolutely, uh, Hendrik Motorsport should be able to use this in Azure Stack uh, at the racetrack. So that's the whole idea. Yeah, nice. I was going to say, I saw on your on your blog post, if you if anyone wants to see all of the details about the cognitive services, if you go to aka.ms, uh, cog services, SVC update, um, you can actually see that full blog post, and there is all sorts in there. It, it took me quite a while to read through it, really, and, uh, and go through some of the links. But all of these things were listed containers, personalizer. Um, we've got the handwriting stuff along with the form stuff. It's, it's really coming together. I mean, uh, in the last few, you know, in the last minute or so, kind of, what's, what's next? What's the vision? <laughs> Well, it's, it's going to, what we're trying to do here is just continue to take innovations that are um, not available to developers and make them easier, make them more approachable, and make them accessible to developers so that you don't have to go deep into the machine learning frameworks in order to get uh, advanced techniques actually and put them right into your application. And that's one of the key areas that we're focused on across these services. Nice, nice. 
Well, we are up on time. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if only we could have had longer to talk about all the different things that are happening. Um, for everyone who's here at Build and online, um, Anand and Lance both have sessions at Build. Um, please watch them on Catch Up or, or attend in person. Uh, thank you very much for your time. This has been uh, What's New with Azure Cognitive Services at Microsoft Build Live. Thank you. Thank you.